Good. Thanks for the reminders. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this goes back again to the multi-cycle processor that we have seen in great detail in uh, lab five and many lectures. And uh, every instruction took multiple cycles in this. <clears throat> So for example, if it was a no-load, no non-load instruction, then we could do it in two cycles, right? We fetch it and we, <clears throat> the moment it comes out of memory, the moment we have the instruction in our hand, we can decode it and execute it, update the register file. So two cycles it takes to do this non-load instruction. On the other hand, if it's a load instruction, then you issue the load to the data memory and one cycle later or several cycles later you'll get the answer back you know from the data memory so for load instructions you know you have uh, this thing and then it will send uh, some address to uh, data memory and then you get a response back in the load weight state so there are three states three cycles it takes to do a load instruction all other instructions were taking two cycles in this implementations that we talked about at length. <clears throat> now we can do a very simple calculation about performance in this. Assuming 20% load instructions, you can calculate how many cycles uh, will be taken by program. So, you know, 0.8 uh, fraction of the instructions will take two cycles and 0.2 the instructions will take three cycles so on an average you're talking of 2.2 cycles per instructions and of course we want to do better than that if you can do better than that then we'll have higher performance in the system and if you have very high memory latency things are just going to get worse in this okay because instruction fetch will take time and the data references will take time and so on Another thing to observe in any uh, such multi-cycle system is that there is a lot of unused hardware at any given point. So when we are doing fetch, nothing is happening in the rest of the hardware over there, right? In the execute phase. When we are doing execute, then fetch is idling at that point. So can we do better? Can we make use of better make uh, use, better use of hardware? that we have already got, right, by trying to pipeline the system, right? So that's another motivation for pipelining that maybe we can use hardware more efficiently and get higher performance out of it. <clears throat> okay, so the new problems that you saw because of pipelining are, first is the control hazard, and this is the most fundamental one, because you can't even get started. If you're going to have two instructions, Right? How do I know what is the next instruction unless I finish executing the first one? Right? Because if it's a branch instruction, execution has to finish, only then I know which way the branch went. So in general, you have to wait for the execution to complete before you know for sure what is the next uh, instruction to be executed. Though you can say, you know, there is a pretty good guess that the next instruction is going to be PC plus 4. Because, you know, not every instruction is a jump instruction in your program. And if every instruction is not a jump instruction, then of course it's PC plus 4, PC plus 4. So, <clears throat> the moment we pipeline, we have to guess what is the next instruction. Otherwise, I can't do anything. Right? I'm going to do the control part, fetch, start the fetch, it finishes execution, then I come back here again and do the next fetch. But I'm ambitious, I want to start the next fetch as soon as the first one is launched. So I have no choice but to guess the program counter in this case. And in the simple machines we have been studying so far, though we look at cleverer schemes later on, it says PC plus 4. Let's just guess that the next instruction to be executed is PC plus 4. So solution is speculate. And any time you see the word speculate, there is a word that always goes with it. Sooner or later, you will have to squash. Because if the speculation is not right, you have to recover. You have to bring the machine to the right state. So regardless of what kind of how good a prediction I have, 
I have to have a mechanism inside the machine. When the speculation goes wrong, how do I get rid of the other instructions that were executing speculatively in the machine? And this can be easy or difficult depending upon how complex a machine we built. Okay, now suppose I get more ambitious and I pipelined this further. I have a three-stage pipeline because until now I was doing way too much work. Decode, execute, issue to memory, get back from memory, etc. So if I pipeline it further, the idea is that this very fat thing is, you know, I'm going to bring it into two more reasonable chunks, right? So what will happen in the first part? Decode, you know, so we can do decode, we can also do register fetch. We can go and fetch the data from the registers uh, and then in the execute part, I have already fetched the data, I already know the instruction, I just execute it. So things may go better that way and then we will do the <clears throat> update. The moment you do su such a thing, you have a serious problem, a very serious issue and the problem is data hazards, right? The data hazard is that if I'm reading some registers in this state and there is an instruction ahead of me which is going to be modifying the state, we have to make sure that those modifications have been done. Or in other words, I'm not reading the old values, I'm not reading the stale values, I have to read the latest value and this problem is generally called <clears throat> the data hazard problem and the general solution to uh, this problem is stall. Why does stall work? Yes? You can wait until the data before the time is finished updated, then you can be sure that it's like all the data is updated. Fantastic, right? So if I just wait, if I'm a little bit patient, right, whatever is ahead of me is going to finish. And finishing or completion of an instruction by definition means you have updated all the state, right? But if you are too patient, you're going to get no performance. Right? So we have to make sure that, you know, we can start uh, doing things even before, uh, you know, every instruction has been ahead of us has been uh, committed. But in some cases, we will have to stall because the instruction, the data we want is not available yet. Okay, so that's the general idea behind stalls. So two quite distinct problems present in all machines, all sophisticated machines we build you know, control hazards and data hazards, and this is a very, very general solution. We always solve control hazards by doing speculation. We always solve data hazards. Well, actually, that's not completely true. We can speculate even in case of data hazards, but that's a very, very, very advanced topic, and very few machines, actually no machines does value prediction. I, I won't get into it. Anyway, so when it comes to data hazards, we always wait. We stall until the data hazard disappears. Okay, so my plan today is I want to tell you about a very general solution. I want to think of the machine as being in two pieces, right? One is going to be fetching instructions, the other part is going to be executing it. And see how do I, what problems arise, some control hazards, how do I fix it? And once you understand this, you'll be able to use this idea of impunity regardless of which machine you're building. And we play the same game with the three-stage machine. We'll introduce data hazards and then again discuss very, very in very general terms, you know, how is a data hazard resolved? How do I stall the machine so that I get the right answers from it? And in doing all this, we'll be using many, many code fragments that you have uh, written earlier. So for example, for us, decode will remain just a function, right? Execute, which computes the next state, will just remain a function. And then we'll play games with how we can arrange all these things. Okay. <clears throat> in some sense, the pipeline machines we are developing, in some very real sense, is very elastic. It's very forgiving of latencies here and there, right? Uh, then the very synchronous machine that Daniel showed you in the lecture, which is easy to understand and you must understand it just to get the, uh, these concepts of control hazards and data hazards. Uh, you must understand them before you get into this lecture. Okay, control hazards. So this is one view of it. 
I have two parts in the machine and both are going to be executing instructions concurrently, right? One instruction here, another instruction here. I absolutely don't care how many cycles it takes in the fetch part or how many cycles it takes in the execution part. What I'm interested in is I want to get two instructions going, one in the fetch stage and the other one in the execute stage. So you can think of it, these two parts are connected by a spring, okay, which is our FIFO. This keeps dumping instructions in the FIFO, the second part keeps picking instructions from the FIFO and execute them. The idea more or less works. The only time, you know, uh, we'll have problems, so we can easily design a finite state machine. By that I mean you can write a rule, maybe two rules, right, which will take something, initiate a memory read, and put relevant information in this F to D queue that is sitting in the middle of these two things. Similarly, you know enough about instruction execution that if I gave you the instruction, you certainly know you're going to do register fetches and, uh, and execute and update, etc. So that's what will happen in the second part. You can design a machine for that as well. These two machines more or less work independently except in the case of except in the case of a branch. So how do they interact in case of a branch? Yes? <laughs> okay. He has food in his mouth, so I'll, I'll yes. Right. So, you know, we were merely speculating in the fetch part, right? So, of course, we are updating the PC here all the time. But the real story is in the execute. And as long as our guesses are right, no problem. But suppose our guess is wrong, then we have to do something. And we will also have to go and write the PC. And now there is very curious interaction going on. So these two parts are not independent of each other. They affect each other. And that's what the problem is of control hazards. And let's see how do we solve it, right? We will offer a solution here which is independent of how many cycles it's taking here or there and so on. Okay, <clears throat> so timing diagram, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. You have seen these diagrams before. So this is my multi-cycle, unpipelined machine, right? So if I had something, you know, instruction I0 goes, in, uh, it's in the fetch stage, then it's in the execute stage, then it'll be I1, etc. right? So you can keep doing it, and if you happen to have a load instruction, it'll go fetch, execute, load. Very, very simple. You know, there is no overlap anywhere. You're just, uh, a multi-cycle machine works like this. All right, now, Suppose we have this, but we pipeline it. We say, I want this system to behave so that it can have one instruction on this side and another instruction on the other side. Overlapped execution. So what does the timing diagram look like in that case? Did you have a question? No, okay. So, <clears throat> so what happens is we do I0, I1, and now comes the fun part. At the same time we do I1. We are speculating, we are guessing that the next instruction to be done is I1 at this stage. So see in this vertical column now two instructions are active. That's what I mean when I say more than one instruction is active. Two instructions are active at any given point, right? And then I can do this, speculate again, I2, etc. And it goes on and on like this. Oh yeah, yeah, there is a gap here. So why is this gap here? Right, because when the load is happening, at that time you can't be doing a fetch. Right, I mean, there. <clears throat> that's the reason why you have to lose uh, a cycle. You go from uh, I3, but uh, you can't do anything in the middle stage over there, so there's a, a gap over there. Yes? can hold only one instruction at a time, this side, right? 
I have only this this is the only pipeline stage I have. Oh yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. This is not the fastest machine. All the whole problem I'm trying to solve is on the red line, I want one instruction on this side and up to one instruction on the other side. And as long as there is maximum of one instruction, right, either it's in the execute stage or it's in the load stage. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, we consider a slightly different case where the first instruction is branch. So suppose I0 is branch. Okay, so it's like this. And now I discover my speculation was wrong. That actually when you execute I0, you figure out the next instruction is not I1, but it is I7. So you would have detected this here, that is the speculation correct? If it, the speculation was correct, then it will look like the previous diagram. If it is wrong, then what, what happens in this case? Now we have to do some work, right? So, okay, do not execute I1, because if you executed I1, hell will break loose, right? you will updating state and all kinds of things will go wrong. So we have to throw this away and this is called squashing, you know, somehow we have to squash I1 and at the same time start the fetch of I7, which is the correct instruction to be fetched at this point. Because we know at the end of I0 what is the next instruction uh, to be done. And then you will go on like this. Now, I did it like this, but as you will see when we start doing implementations, it's sometimes very difficult to do these switches so easily. I mean, I made the squash here go as fast as I could, you know, so instantly, you know, it deleted it. But you can imagine, oh, I'm a little bit not so smart, you know, so my i7 may move one more cycle to the right. And if it does that, lower performance, but there is no correctness issue in that. Yes? I can always, you know, once I know the correct instruction, the most important thing is old instructions must be squashed, like I1 must be squashed, and the next instruction to execute must be I7. But whether you do it exactly in this cycle or the next cycle is a performance issue. It's not a correctness issue at that point. On the other hand, if you didn't squash I1, that's clearly a correctness issue. You'll just get wrong results. Okay, so let's dissect this piece by piece. How do I detect a misprediction? Go ahead. Yeah, but now I'm thinking implementation, right? So how do I know and execute that it's a misprediction? I know that I want to jump to I7, but I have to know that the instruction coming after me is not I7, right? Yes? Is it like PC, is it PC plus 4? Then, if you're like always predicting PC plus 4, Right. Right, but in general, we may, as you will see, we'll get very clever and we may make all kinds of predictions. So what we can do is, we can flow the prediction along with the instruction. So when we fetch the instruction, at that time we have decided what is the next instruction we're going to fetch, right? So that instruction counter, let's call it PPC, predicted program counter. So as this instruction moves forward in the pipeline, along with the instruction, I also carry PPC. And now when this instruction actually executes and it says, oops, I'm supposed to be I7, you say I7 is not equal to PPC. PPC was PC plus 4 in our case, and therefore a misprediction. Is everybody with me? Right? That if we carry the instruction, our prediction with us, then when the real answer is known, we can say it's a misprediction or it's not a misprediction. So this is step one. <clears throat> At the execute stage, we say it's a misprediction. Second problem to be solved. What does it mean to squash a partially executed instruction? This is the effect we want. The effect we want is it must not update the register file or the PC, it must not launch a store into the memory. 
I always like this, you know, like to think of memory as something and stores is like launching a missile. You can't retract it. Right? So we can do lots of things in the pipeline, but store is like a black box. Once you say store, right, you can't say, oh, sorry, please send it back. I didn't mean to update it. That doesn't work at all. So whenever it's stored, you have to be very, very careful. You do not even launch it if you have the slightest doubt that this store should not have been done. Yes. So we have this like cool question mark thing, right? Yes. If we detect a misprediction, then the instruction that's going to end up being propagated, we can just replace all the parts with a question mark. Right, but how? That's the question. <laughs> I mean, you just change the like executed instruction. Right, right, right. But I mean, if you're thinking low-level hardware, you have to replace something with something, right? Because you're about to do this, but now you're going to do something else. Right, so that's what I'm trying to get to, you know, that we have to devise a mechanism, right, for squashing uh, instructions, right? <clears throat> and, you know, we are talking about very simple machines right now. One instruction here, one instruction over here. So we just have to squash what was coming behind us. Yes? Because this instruction has detected whatever is coming behind me is wrong. So you have to make sure that we do take some action so that whatever coming behind me, whatever is coming behind me cannot change the state of the machine. Because it's wrong, wrongly speculated instruction is coming behind me. Yes? Okay, so now let me suggest a very, very general technique for dealing with this. And this technique is known as EPOX. So just as instruction was flowing forward and you had attached a PPC to it. This is the PC, this is the PPC, etc. with the instruction as it's going through the pipeline. We're going to attach one more fact with it. An epoch. Think of it as a color, right? So we are issuing red instructions right now. So we keep issuing red instructions. We are in the red epoch. And then in the execute stage, oops, misprediction. What do I do? Enter a new epoch, right? Change the color. You say, from now on, any red instruction I see is just wrong. Because I know instructions coming behind me are red, right? Because I'm red right now. So I change the epoch to, say, green. I change the color to green. So now, all the instructions that are behind me, if, they, if the red ones are coming, toss it, toss it, because they're all mispredicted instructions. On the other hand, the moment I see a green instruction, I say, aha, finally this is the right path instruction again. Does everybody understand this idea? Yep. So, is it, would it be equivalent to saying, like, if it's, if it's like a valid instruction, then the epoch will be, like, green, and if it's invalid, it'll be red? Or something? Uh, Actually, instructions are always valid, but they happen to be on the wrong path. Okay. They, they are speculated instructions, and we're not going on that path anymore. So all those things that are going on that path, we have to clean up the machine. We have to squash them, all those instructions. And my scheme is very, very simple. I start out red, and lots of red instructions are coming behind me. I go here and say, speculation failure. Right? So now I'm going to use green color from now on. I have to find a way of doing this, right? So from now on, it's ensured to me that all the correct path instructions will be coming from the green side, from the right PC, etc. But in the meantime, if I receive a red instruction, it's guaranteed to be wrong path instruction. Drop it. Don't execute that instruction. Yes? What is it that makes this better than having just like a valid bit for each, each instruction in the pipeline? Is yep. And so that, like, if it was invalid, it just wouldn't be able to um, trigger, like, the enable for, like, register rights or memory stores? Is it? No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the idea. The question is should we have so much reach that we can instantly keep track of all the instructions which are behind me and mark them invalid? Uh, so this is the complexity of the hardware that has to change. Right, right. And it's a question of, you know, you may change your mind tomorrow about how your fetch part operates, 
right? So you say, oops, I have to gash that one too, <laughs> right? So I'm giving you a more general solution in terms of epochs. And it's not going to be any more expensive, you know, so, you know, don't think in terms of expense yet, hardware expense for this. The important idea is to understand the concept. Yes? Why not just have the execute stage um, mark instructions invalid until it finds, like, the predicted next program encounter, which at that point it knows we're back on the right track? You're, I mean, it's absolutely possible. I can look back and say, okay, these are the instructions in various stages in my pipeline. And I know by definition they're all wrong now because this one went wrong. This one is telling me that the predictions are wrong. So I could reach out and go and mark them all invalid. This is a valid strategy, right? Uh, this will be a correct design for the machine. We are doing something slightly more general. We are just saying right now I accept red instructions and I've changed my mind from now on I'm only going to accept green instructions. And I don't care how long it takes. The moment a red instruction comes to me, I toss it, right? But the two things have to be done very tightly together. When I change the color to green, I have to make sure I change the PC to the correct PC, right? That's not speculated PC anymore. So any time there is a change of epoch was because of misprediction. And at the time of misprediction, you change the epoch and you set the PC right. Yes? So if you use epochs, you don't need a predicted program counter? Uh, say, say that again? If you use epochs, you don't need a predicted program counter? No, no, you still do. Because, ah, uh, that goes back to my fetch unit can't do anything. You know, it, it starts a fetch, you know, what should it do now? It, it always has to predict the next PC. And next PC has to be predicted very, very fast. So in our case, it's super fast, it's PC plus four. But you're gonna see more interesting ways of predicting the next instruction. Yes? Each instruction will, will append an epoch to, to, to the instruction? Is that the plan? Yes, that's the plan. <laughs> so there is an epoch register, and in the fetch stage, you will attach it to the instruction. And the epoch register will be changed. And by the time this instruction reaches the execute part, if the two things don't match, its color and the current epoch register, you say, sorry, I was on the wrong path. <clears throat> so let's see the code for this. This is my finite state machine. This is my rule for the fetch part. Is it trivial or what? What is this rule doing? It's issuing a request to the memory, right? Which is what it does. You know, whatever is the value of PC. And then it's making a prediction, PPC. In this simple case, it's PC plus four, right? And then it's saying the next value of PC is PPC. So in the next cycle, you will see, you'll be fetching PPC here. And then whatever all this PC, PPC, epoch, you enqueue, right? So the idea is you have enqueued this in F2D, you have issued a request to the memory, and after a while, you know, these two things will converge at the decode part. I'll be waiting, I'll be waiting for an instruction to come from the memory. And I'll be seeing, you know, what is in the F2D, what is in that FIFO, what is its epoch, what is its prediction, etc. So I have en uh, enqueued everything here, and now let's see the second part, what happens in the DQ stage. So I should have animated this, which I forgot, but just see the first uh, four lines or something. First two lines. What is the first line telling us? Inst is coming from memory. So there is an implicit guard here. This whole rule can't execute until you have an instruction from the memory. So this is completely independent of whether memory is taking one cycle or 10 cycles or 50 cycles, whether there was a cache hit or a cache miss, right? Whenever you get an instruction, only then this rule can execute. What is the second thing it's saying? We have to see this instruction, you know, what are the other things that went with it? 
right? It's prediction, it's epoch, and so on. That's all in F to D. So I'm taking out all that information. <clears throat> and now comes the fun part. What is this? So this is the epoch that came with the instruction. And now what am I doing? I'm seeing that by the time instruction was fetched, did something, you know, did the epoch change? Because these were all predictions. If they are the same, then we are on the correct path. If they have changed, then it should be, we should do nothing. It should be no op. So that's what is happening over here, that it's the right path instruction because this is equal to this. And now you are experts in this. Code to compute e inst from inst, right? This is the code we have written gazillion times by now. And now I can also compute the misprediction, which is just comparing the real next PC with the PPC, right? And if it's a misprediction, then PC gets this and epoch gets the new epoch, the next epoch. Yes? Um, so it looks like epoch is uh, just like a single bit. Yes. Um, can this potentially cause problems if you have a lot of stages in your pipeline? And That's a very deep question. And actually, this will make an excellent question on the quizzes also. Right? So when we get into deep pipelines, then we will see whether one bit is enough or not. Do I need to keep two, three colors? Right? To understand the idea of epochs, don't worry about how many colors. You can draw as many colors as you want. In implementation, of course, we can have only so many bits. And I'm making an assertion right now that in this one, two colors are enough. We, are, we have right instructions, and then it'll become wrong at some state, and then we can flip it. Right? But it'll require a little bit of thought to figure out why one bit is enough. I mean, why two states are enough. Yes. Uh, so the epoch that we are comparing, there's two of them. There's epoch D and epoch. Epoch D is going to come from the instruction that we fetched. But is epoch just epoch is just a register? Okay, so it's going. It's to a global be register. So you right, 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 right. And what is it? What would it be initialized to? Uh, it'll be initialized to red. <laughs> I mean, it's it's flipping. Bit flipping is symmetric in this case. Right, it doesn't matter whether you initialize it to true or false, but you know it has to be something. Was there another question? Yes. Um, why do you need to send both PC and PPC in F two D So uh, it's not clear at this stage, but you will recall that if there is a jump instruction, right, of branches, often the for computation of exactly where we are going requires the PC value because all the jumps are specified relative to PC. So this is some data I need in order to execute the instruction. So I have instruction moving forward, PC also moving with it, and the prediction. Prediction is about what is following me, right? And the epoch. Yes? Can you clarify when you bring the PC along with the instruction because the when we decode instruction in the future, we'll be setting PC as PC plus four, and so we can't just like, the value of PC which exists currently and then use that in order to jump because that would be like... Right, right, right. Very good point that if there's a PC register, why not go and read it, right? Because, you know, something else is going on there. You know, somebody is also already fetching the next instruction. So I have to remember this instruction, what is the corresponding PC and therefore I take it with me. Yes? Do we have PC as like another variable or as another Stored yes. No, not stored. It's well, just going with the instruction, the, right? In the or whatever. Yes. Um, we have that because it could be some other prediction method that we have, other than yes, yes, method. yes. Very clever ones. <laughs> there are thousands of papers published on what is a what is a good prediction. In fact, there is a yearly competition on the best predictor. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right. Good. Oh, I, am I done with this slide? Yes, I mean, the rest is straightforward in this. So I was very happy with this, went and ran it. What is this? 
So GCD, oops, <laughs> took more cycles in my pipeline machine than in my multi-cycle machine. Something is wrong here, right? All, everything is doing worse. <laughs> At least in case of this uh, benchmarks, which are no hazard, you know, you are executing instructions which don't depend on each other. Then it does well, but not, <laughs> I mean, it's doing worse than the takeaway is, it's doing worse than multi-cycle. We started out with the goal of making things go faster. We end up making things slower. This is not very uncommon in computer architecture. You know, you have a wonderful idea. You say you change the world. You implement it and it sucks, right? <laughs> now there are two possibilities at that point that the idea really sucks. Or no, 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 you forgot something. You, know, you have to adjust. And that's generally the case. Whenever you have an idea in architecture, it requires two, three, four adjustments before it pays off. That's what I want to walk through. Yes? Is the cycle the same? Sorry? Is the cycle the same? I'm just calling the cycles. So that's a separate question. How big is the clock cycle? For that, we'll have to do synthesis. We have done that, but I don't want to get into it right now. OK. So why is this the case? What went wrong here? We did such brilliant analysis. We wrote correct code. We got right answers. Uh, zero performance, negative performance out of it. So look at these two rules. And what's happening here? Both are updating PC. First one, of course, updates it every time. And the second one updates it only in case of misprediction. But as far as we are concerned, these two rules, conflict, last lecture, right? Conflict, you know, they cannot run to together because if you run them together, right, there'll be all kinds of problems. Only those rules can be executed together which do not conflict. Oops, so we have to change PC and if I change PC here, then it conflicts with do fetch. What should I do? Can you have like a, another register that, you, that do execute with like put in the replacement PC and like a flag saying it needs to be updated and then do fetch? So try these things and you will figure out regardless of how you, they'll conflict. <laughs> yes? Split the rule into two. So here is that idea. So suppose you have rule one. What does rule one do? R1 gets E1. And rule two, which depending upon some predicate, R2 gets E2 and R1 gets E3. So which is the case in which these two rules conflict? Not P, right? Aha, that's the solution, right? So what I do is I split it. I split the second rule into two rules. And I have made P into a guard, right? So rule two, true, rule true, false. <laughs> rule two, false, right? Mm -hmm. Does this transformation look correct to you? I have taken the second rule, right? And I'm saying if it's true, then do this part, which is R2 gets E2. And if it is false, then do, right, R1 gets P3. That's rule, the other rule. And what's the motivation? So I, I think that the rule twos, the true and the false version, won't conflict with each other. That right. Mm -hmm. And rule one and two true won't conflict with each other. Right. But rule one and rule two false could conflict with Absolutely. each other. Absolutely. So if it turns out that rule two true, <laughs> I should have chosen better names, okay, if the true side rule is the common case, then at least in that case you can do one and two together. Right? If P is false, then you know it will be conflicting. So what do you expect? Do you expect mispredictions to be the common case? 
or correct prediction to be the common case? Correct prediction, right? I mean, that's why, otherwise, we are really being stupid, right? We might as well toss a coin and do whatever, right? So, <clears throat> this is a very general idea that you can take a rule and split into two rules, which doesn't go either way, but the advantage is not possible that one of these does not conflict with my main flow. And this was the common case. And if that happens, I'm winning. That means most of the time, you know, I'll be able to do these two rules together. If P happens to be false, I'm unlucky, and then things won't happen in parallel. Let me give you a slightly more complex version of this. Same example is just that, uh, you know, there is a lot of actions going on in your rule, uh, rule two. And P depends upon some of these actions, the values you have computed, etc. So technically, you can still pull it out as a guard, but it's too much work. You won't want to do that. I mean, that's just, you will get exhausted if you try to do this. So here is another way of doing it, which is, uh, I'm going to show you the following. What I'm going to do is, in case, so remember, the idea is to isolate R1, I mean, the, the true part of this thing. The idea is that I want to create a separate rule for this, right? But instead of trying to execute it instantaneously, let's just remember that, you know, what is the value of P, and in the next cycle we'll execute it, which is what we would have done anyway. So it's not going to be any slower, but it's just simpler to organize it like this. So whatever this condition was, you know, I have remembered it, but otherwise this, uh, this rule looks exactly the same as before, right? So this rule, there is no change in this. All I have done is I have stored P into a P reg. I have remembered it. And I have taken out the else part in this. So now this rule and this rule do not conflict. And in case there is, you know, P turns out to be false, you know, then this rule can't execute. And in the next cycle, this rule will execute. So this is yet another way of splitting the rule, right? Which just takes the offending case and delays it one cycle later by remembering the condition. Okay. That's the solution here now. What are you going to do in this case? You're going to remember the misprediction. So you can introduce a register in which you will remember the misprediction part, and then you'll create a new rule and move it there. In do execute, remember misprediction in a register, introduce a new rule to do the rule change, etc., etc. You'll have to adjust the guards to make everything work. You're going to do it. This is going to be in lab seven. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, because I have done lap 7 already, right? So this is what you get. So did things improve? GCD didn't improve, right? This no hazard benchmark, thank God, improved, because there was no hazards between instructions in this. So you know, here we are really going along. It's taking half as many cycles. And this last benchmark is nasty. You know, everything is a control hazard in this, and it's getting very bad here. It's taking 17, uh, 16 cycles went to 37 cycles. These are all diabolical benchmarks, except for GCD, right? Designed to illustrate some point. <clears throat> so this is not good. Can I do better than this? So you can do the analysis of this, these benchmarks, and you will. So now, let me suggest an improvement. So what were we doing in our thing, right? We had fetch rule, then we had this execute rule, common case we had separated so that it works. In case of a misprediction, it takes an extra cycle, it goes to this third rule, right? And then it executes. And what does it do in the third rule? It jumps back to the fetch, says, okay, fetch is okay, I've set it. 
the new epoch and the fetch, etc. I have not given you that code because that's, so that's what you're supposed to write. So the idea is, if I'm going to do all that, why don't I start the fetch right here? I can send the request to the memory from this misprediction part. That will save a cycle instead of going from here back to fetch and then inside, then initiate a memory fetch, instruction fetch. In initiate the instruction fetch from the misprediction part. That saves one cycle. And if you do that, indeed, you get more improvements. So now we got slightly ahead of GCD in this case by making this improvement. And results are beginning to look good, right? They're still not fantastic, right? So we can do even more tricks than this, and we can improve in two is bypass PC and epoch updates from execute to do fetch, etc. Exactly what that means, how do I bypass, requires more technology. We'll have to introduce some new concepts, and I will do it in L23, right? But if you do do that, the results will be phenomenal. Right? So that's the point at which you can say, yay, man, right? This lab seven is a complete setup for what you'll be doing in the project also. It's like a vow of exercise, right? Because we'll open up so many avenues for you. You say, oh, I can improve this. Oh, I can improve that. This is exactly how process design works. You will have many, many ideas. But you have to try it out and see which one works. And sometimes you have to adjust quite a few things before the idea pays off. But what I'm showing is, you can't say we can't do control hazards properly. We can. I mean, I'm showing you results step by step. But you have to analyze it. You have to understand exactly what you're doing with this. OK, so the, uh, the next stage will be we say execute is too fat, right? And why don't I break it into uh, two parts, right? So I'm breaking into uh, two parts, and when I do that, there will be the decode part, which will actually decode the instruction as well as do register fetch. Then put it into another FIFO, which will, after that, I'll do the execute. So now in this kind of a pipeline system, you know, three instructions could be going on simultaneously. One in the fetch part, one in the decode part, and one in the execute part. And the new problem that we have to solve here is uh, the, the problem of, so I, I took the decode part, you can write down this fetch part. Oh, by the way, our solution to you know, this epox is going to work now. We don't have to worry about epox, right? The same idea will work whether it's two stage or 15 stages in your pipeline. Okay, so now in the decode, what all do you do? You're waiting for the instructions, you're waiting for F to D54, to give you the information, and once you have all that, you can decode it, you can read the register file, and then you enqueue the results in D, uh, D to E, 54, right, which is there. And execute part just reads things off uh, the execute D to E, 54, and then does the execute, right? So this is all the steps that you have seen before. And you do this, but unfortunately, this is not going to quite work. We have to make changes because of data hazards. Because the values you are reading, the values that are being read in this rule over here, you know, read register file, may not be the latest values. Because some values may be updated here in the register file, in the execute part. And when it's being updated over there, then you, know, you will get wrong results over there. So dealing with data hazards, which is sort of read after write hazards. So again, I can go through the same questions with you. How do I know that there is a data hazard? How do I know that there is a data hazard? Execute is changing a register that decode depends on. Exactly. So decode is actually has sources in the instruction, right? Which it reads from the register file. So I can look at each source and see if there is some instruction ahead of me which is modifying that destination, which is the destination. Uh, okay, if anybody is writing into that register. If that is the case, 
then there is a data hazard and in that case we must stall we must stall and let the instructions ahead of me finish and once they finish then we can let this instruction go so we need a mechanism for uh, stalling and <clears throat> I can't do it fast enough so I'm going to stop but we need to introduce the concept of a scoreboard in this which keeps track of all the destinations that are being written into any instruction that is in the pipeline what is going to be writing which register is going to be writing you keep it and now you can compare it against that and you can uh, look at the data structure part of it it interface looks like this you have the scoreboard you can search it to see if any instruction is writing into it right so it will return true or false you can insert something into the scoreboard the destination register or you can remove something from the scoreboard okay and we'll pick it up sometime in future all right good